All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego as usual. And today, I'm so delighted to welcome back Mary Jane Mapes. How are you doing, Mary Jane? Great. Good to be here, John. Excellent, excellent. And Mary Jane, uh, for those of you who need reminding, is a leadership speaker, executive coach. She's a leadership and communication strategist and business relationship expert. And we have a really interesting subject to talk about today. And that is becoming a leader capable of creating a culture of fearless participation. Okay, so fearless participation, such an interesting term, Mary, Mary Jane. So maybe let's get straight into it and explain what you mean by fearless participation. Well, um, when I think of fearless participation, I think of, um, first of all, it, it comes from having a leader who really is authentic, somebody who's authentic. And mm -hmm. by someone that's authentic, it's somebody that really relates well to other people meaning they are authentic, they are courageous, they're trustworthy. These are people that they know who they are. Um, they realize their own strengths. They understand the principles by which they live their life. And they're what I would call self-driven. And I'm talking about this because I think until you've got those folks leading the organization, you're not gonna have fearless participation. So this leader, this authentic leader is somebody that's, they're self-driven. They have a self-driven life. They're not driven by what we would say uh, would call office politics. Mm -hmm. They're not driven by what somebody might think of them or they do it because, you know, it just feels good in the moment or they don't do it because they might look good in the eyes of somebody else, but they're doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. They are the people that can talk about that elephant that we talk about that's in the room. <laughs> They're people that can take a tough stand. They can be, de de uh, what am I trying to say? They can be um, decisive. They right. are people that openly, they're very open with relationship issues. And these are not the people that back away from having tough conversations. They mm -hmm. know how to have tough conversations and they're willing to have them. Um, and those so, are the people really that other people are willing to follow. And it invites other people then to be likewise. They're modeling fearless participation. Yeah. And, I think, and I think that's the key there. What you just said there at the end is, and I'm just writing it down here, is the modeling piece. Because I think uh, you know, we've seen so many examples throughout our careers and all of that of people who say all the right things, but their behavior uh, you know, model something completely different, right? As you said, mm -hmm. whether it's office politics, whether it's not following through, whether it's not being transparent and all of that. So right. in order to be successful here, the leader has to, you know, it really does have to be very self-aware. Extremely self-aware. And <laughs> that's easier for some people than it is for mm -hmm. others. Some people just find it you know, very difficult to be self-aware for a variety of reasons. Yeah, and the interesting part is that the, the self-awareness piece is that um, it is probably one of, as you know, one of the hardest things to, to go through a process of becoming self-aware, but it's also an extremely liberating thing. And it is the key to, I'm, in my personal opinion, it's the key to success uh, in the future. So when you work, when you work with, when you work with leaders, how do you get them to that place of where they can model the correct behaviors and they can be aware of whether they're modeling the correct behaviors? Well, I think it comes back to exactly what you just mentioned, uh, John, and that is a business of being self-aware. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's hard to be self-aware for a lot of people because, you know, we always like to be the hero of our own story. And so we like to see ourselves as being pretty okay. And sometimes people don't like to find out that how they see themselves and how other people see them are not necessarily one and the same. Um, I think sometimes people, and I've seen this again and again and again in organizations, and I don't know how else to say it other than I think people spend too much time focusing on this person they think they should be. In other words, this person they really would like to be because somehow or another, there are certain personality styles that have been glamorized to think, whoa, if you're going to lead an organization, you got to be this way. 
And so they're focusing on that as opposed to focusing on um, getting to really know themselves. Who are mm-hmm. they truly? And the thing is the people that zero in on self-awareness and they discover who they are, they find out, and this is the part that I love about it. They find out that they're really pretty extraordinary themselves. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, and the interesting thing is sometimes if you go through that process of self-awareness, maybe you discover that this role isn't the right one for you. Maybe you shouldn't be the leader. Maybe you're much better as an ex, as, as an expert who kind of operates on their own or, or whatever. There's multiple things. But I think the other thing, um, Mary Jane, is that we celebrate in, 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 in corporate, um, in corporations across the world, but we always celebrate one career path. And that is going manager, you know, leader and all of that. And we don't, we don't sort of say, yes, that's a great career path for some people, but not for everyone. Right, right. And that's why I think when you spend that time and you get to know yourself better, um, and there are a lot of ways people can, can do that. Um, I, I do think that's, that's absolutely foundational. And once they discover that, then they can make better choices. But you asked a bit ago, and I, I'm not sure I really answered the question, was if people wanted to become more self-aware, how would they actually yeah. do that? And I think one of the most important things is to actually spend time. And this is what I find people have the hardest time doing, is thinking that it's actually valuable to spend time in quiet, personal self-reflection. They, 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 they don't want to do that. They feel like I'm wasting my time, but in reality, it's a fabulous practice. And I'm going to give you just an example Mm -hmm. of, let's say my own. Um, And this is my own, comes from my own spiritual practice right? where love is really the focus. So what I do is I, I do this every morning. I mean, I sit there and I usually spend some time, you know, asking where am I falling short? I mean, I just ask the question where am I falling short? And then I wait. And sometimes it's just in the waiting. It's not thinking about anything. The answer arrives. It shows up. And I find out, ah, (laughs) are you really being this loving person that you say you are? Are you this loving person that you say you want to be? And if you're not, with whom are you not being so loving? And what might be um, the belief? What might be the attitude? What might be the assumption that you're holding about that person or about that situation or whatever that is causing you to really not respond from a really a loving, respectful place? So I think just that has been more personally valuable to me and people that I know that, that do it than just about anything. Yeah. And you touch on a really, I mean, I think that's a really incredibly important point that you raised there. And I think it is, it is certainly one that people struggle with, as you said, we struggle with in their professional lives, in their personal lives, because we're so bombarded and surrounded by distractions. And we almost live in this, and the, and the, almost like the pervasive culture says, oh, no, no, you should never be alone with your thoughts. You should always be connecting with people. You should have things, you should have things flying in. You should be on your device. And it's, and as you said, it's that reflection time. And I think that is the part that can really differentiate people is those people who take time out both in their personal and their professional lives to be with themselves and with their own thoughts. Yes. If we can be with our, with ourselves and with our own thoughts and it's not trying to fix yourself it mm-hmm. really is saying how can i be operating and again this is my belief but how can i operate at my highest and my best if i were operating at my highest and best who is this person that i would be of course that also it also helps people if they get some feedback Because sometimes, as I said, we like to be the hero of our own story. So if we ask people for feedback or we there are self-assessments out there that you can take that you can not only take the self-assessment, you ask other people to take an assessment of you and then you get to see the gap 
maybe between where you think you are and where other people think you are. And then, of course, written feedback, verbal feedback. But we have to be open to receiving the feedback as a gift. But we don't ask people if we don't think that these are people that are going to tell us the truth from their perspective. Like, what are my strengths? I always that I love that stop, start, continue. What should I start doing that I'm not doing now that would definitely make me more effective? What should I stop doing that maybe I'm doing and I'm not even aware that I'm doing it? Or I might be aware thinking it's a positive thing and it's having a negative impact. And is there anything that I'm doing that's being effective that you think I should keep doing? Right. That's a little thing, but it pays huge dividends if we actually pay attention to it. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I, and I think, as you said, though, if you're going to do go through that process, you have to be prepared for the feedback. Um, because otherwise, there's no point going into a process and basically saying, okay, Mary Jane, give me feedback, but only give me good stuff. Right. Because some people, <laughs> that's all they want. And then they get defensive. Yeah. And then, you know, you shut down, you don't give them feedback because you know they don't really want it. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I always um, think is that uh, we've done a great disservice uh, in calling some of the things that we're talking about here as soft skills, right? And I think, mm -hmm. and because it's very easy, you think in any company, if you said today, oh, uh, I want to invest in in some soft skills training, I mean, that is the the first thing that's going to get cut in any any mm -hmm. any budget or cutback, or that's going to be a hard a hard thing to sell to any executive team. Because I think, and as I said, I think part of it is because of the naming of it. It's a, it, Unfortunately, uh, it seems like a nice to have, mm -hmm. but it, it seems as we go on, authenticity, empathy, all of these things, these skills are becoming so incredibly important. And as we have now, maybe virtual workforces, you have to be, be even more communicative and empathetic and authentic in those communications. Well, exactly. And I think part of the reason people are seeing this is because we are living in a time when things are pretty volatile. They're mm -hmm. very uncertain, especially right now. People are very uncertain about what the future holds. Um, there is just a lot of change and uncertainty. And what research has shown, this is why I love working with leaders, because research has shown that those leaders who are the most effective really have these genuine, authentic relationships with the people they serve. In other words, they have a passion for serving other people. And when they have a passion for, and they, they, a lot of people don't start out having a passion for serving other people. They start <laughs> out having a passion for pretty much serving themselves. I mean, yep. let's face it, all of us are in one way or another fairly self-serving, mm -hmm. but when they realize the power in serving other people, not just to other people, but to themselves, it comes back. Because when people know that you respect them, you honor them, you value the gifts, the talents that they bring, you value their input, you value their ideas, they're certainly up for consideration, that you have respect and dignity for them as people, then they, they, you're one of those people that they love to work for. And then they become passionate about either, if not the work, about the person they work for. And when they're passionate about the person they work for, they go above and beyond for that person. And let's face it, if you don't have any followers, then you really are just a, a leader in name only. So yeah, people yeah. follow people who actually care about them and all the research indicates it. So if you've got passionate leaders, passionate about serving, who then create passionate employees who are passionate about their work and the person they're following and the organization, you've got an organization that's now being much more productive and the more productive they are, the higher the performing organization. Research over and over, there's just ample evidence that shows those two things go together. Great relationships, interest in serving your people and a greater performance overall as an organization. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I totally agree, Mary Jane. And and one of the things that I think, um, and I think this has to be done in in a very authentic fashion, because I do think, you know, you hear a lot about today about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And some of it comes off as inauthentic. Well, it's inauthentic because it is, <laughs> you know, it's like all that brain research that's been done out there. 
people know when you're being genuine, they know when you're being authentic, and they know when you're looking right past them. They know when you mm, don't really mean what you say. They're just mm-hmm. something that clicks inside. They know it. There is a, oh my gosh, if someone, you could go to the internet and find, um, uh, what are they called? Um, oh, oh my gosh. I keep thinking Motley Fool. That's not it. Uh, Monty yeah. Python. Monty the Python. There you go. There is a clip from Monty Python and the Holy Grail that illustrates it perfectly when the king comes riding on his horse. And of course, he's looking and he meets up with a labor. And it's just this whole scene plays out. And Mm -hmm. I mean, the dialogue between the two of them is, is absolutely hilarious. But it indicates when people look through people, don't really care about people, don't not only don't recognize them, don't know their name, don't care, and just see themselves. Well, after all, I am the king. <laughs> yeah. But, well, listen, but, um, hey, hey, listen, Mary Jane, you are the first person to quote Monty Python on this show, and I've done over five or <laughs> nearly six hundred episodes. So kudos to you. Um, yeah, I and I remember, that. I remember that scene as like, I'm your king. Oh, uh, how did you become <laughs> king? I just did. Oh, well, I never, I never voted for you. Well, no, you don't vote for. Me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic <laughs> yeah. scene. Um, but you're right. It's you're right. It's that's a that's a fantastic uh, it's a fantastic example or analogy. Is like yes, you can be appointed, you can be appointed to a leadership position, but it doesn't make you a leader. Right. Absolutely, it does not. Yeah, and and to your point about and and like I said uh, earlier, is that there's a lot you know people are there's a lot of people talking about you know how you have to be empathetic and authentic and all of that, and it's become a little bit where it's like oh where's my checklist oh. I need to be authentic now, or I need to be empathetic right now, instead of going behind and say, no, these things are things that have to, you have to discover them. They have to become, they have to become real. They have to be real, right? You can't manufacture, you can't manufacture empathy. Right. Well, you know why? Because people, um, people just know the difference. That's all. Mm -hmm. They know the difference when you're being genuine. They know the difference when you're being a big phony. Mm -hmm. And it's something we have inside us that just clicks. And if you're being a big phony, then it, it's meaningless to them. In fact, it's almost worse because they, it's like I always say to people, I have taught people how to listen for years, but mm-hmm. I always say to them up front, I can teach you these skills where you can lean forward, you can look concerned, you can nod your head, you can provide all the little nonverbals, you know, you can, you can paraphrase content, reflect feeling, I'm going to teach you how to do this, but I'm not kidding, if your mindset is not in the right place, if you're not actually looking at people with the intent to care about what they have to say, you're honestly interested in getting a new perspective, in seeing how they feel, what they think, why they think as they do, then they're going to see through it. And all that good technique in the world will go right out the window because it goes so much deeper than technique. It's not a technique. It's got to be who we are. And that's my desire to bring people to that understanding and hopefully that awakening. Yeah, I I totally agree with you, Mary Jane, because I think it's better off if you're not that type of person or you're not prepared to be or go through the work or this, you know, the self-awareness to become that type of person, then don't project it. Uh, Be, be, you know, be the, be, be your authentic self and live with the consequences of being your authentic self. Um, And if you're not prepared to go through a a process of, of, you know, self-awakening, self-awareness of of changing or whatever, well then, you know, don't pretend that you did. Right. Yeah, that's exactly, yeah. exactly it. Yeah. Well, listen, Mary Jane, this has been fantastic as usual. Um, such great insights to people. All of Mary Jane's information will be below this video. But for anybody who who uh, who doesn't know Mary Jane, uh, just give us a moment uh, and tell us a little bit more about what you do. Well, um, I have for over 30 years now, I have been uh, doing a lot of leadership development, working. In fact, I started out actually doing work on just helping people develop their communication skills. It's, I mean, we started many years ago, Mm -hmm. but I always found out that I was working with leaders. Well, when you're working with leaders, you're working with leaders, you find out a lot about what's going on. And then you find yourself in leadership positions as well. Mm -hmm. But um, 
that then led to coaching. In fact, I was doing coaching long before I knew that you could get paid for it, <laughs> but um, coaching. And I found that that was extremely helpful. Training is great. Um, I think executive coaching is even much mm. more powerful on the whole. Right now, my major focus is on a program I call Ignite. May I share? Yes, please bit? do. Please May I do. share just a little bit about that? Yes, um, it is really helping leaders become exactly what we were talking about when we started this conversation today, and that is becoming more courageously authentic so that they are operating at their highest and best, both from the inside. I say we're helping people develop from the inside, creating that greater self-awareness, able to bridge the gap between where they are and where they wanna be, and also uh, create that a greater le level of um, courageous authenticity so you can have those conversations, those authentic conversations, not the ones that you think you ought to have, but the ones that people need you to have and that you need to have, and sometimes are difficult. Sometimes you have to talk about the things that mm, a lot of people aren't willing to talk about, but need to be talked about if you're really going to move in the right direction. So it's that inside work, but it's also a combination of the outside work. That includes some education, it includes some skill sets that are going to be needed to create that culture of fearless participation. Because even though you come from the right mindset, having the skills, you put the two together will make it just that much more effective. Um, and then it'll that 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 whole Ignite program also deals with some of those things that help to refine and to polish um, that out the outside of someone so that not only does the inside, the inside now matches the outside in every way. So yeah, you, that's, you that's not only that's... are, but you appear to be, even at first glance, that person who really is the cream of the crop. Yeah, that's uh, and that's beautifully put, and I would really encourage people to check it out. Check it out, um, um, MaryJaneMaves.com, and check out what what Mary Jane is talking about. Look at check, click on the links below the video. Um, I would really encourage it because, uh, like Mary Jane said, training is great and and it's fantastic, but coaching is where you can go up a level and it can be the greatest investment in your career if you go and find yourself an executive coach like Mary Jane. In fact, I recommend you go check out Mary Jane, okay? Um, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again, Mary Jane. Thank you all for listening and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.